Hi and welcome to Biz Today with me, Nazreen Ibrahim. Biz Today is a weekly business show that focuses on successful entrepreneurs as well as investigating latest business trends and other ideas so that we can take learnings away from them. The lineup for this week's show, we've got successful entrepreneur Kyle Frazier in studio talking about his entrepreneurial journey. And then we speak with Jonathan Darker on VC. And what's VC? Venture Capital. This month of July is all about funding. So this is our kickoff conversation, but we'll be focusing on funding a lot more in the coming month. Inside Colombo Coffee Roastery lies Factory Cafe, a barista training center and one of South Africa's only coffee destinations that doubles as an entertainment space, music venue, and art gallery. Situated in the heart of Durban at 369 Magwaza Mapalala Street, Factory offers fresh roasted artisan coffee, exclusive teas, and light meals for breakfast and lunch. You can experience a world of coffee at the award-winning Factory Cafe. Yeah, so to my left here is a, a Probat 25 kg drum roaster. Uh, it uses uh, gas burners underneath the roaster, the drum, to heat the drum. What we then do is through the hopper at the top of the roaster, we drop the coffee into the drum. The drum has paddles inside it which move and churn the coffee, which uh, allow for a consistent roast profile uh, and consistent roasting of all the coffee beans inside the drum. Uh, we roast the coffee for between 10 and 16 minutes, depending on uh, the type of coffee flavor we're after. So, uh, uh, and we then also roast our coffee to a light medium roast profile. What that means is we then keep a lot of the flavors, a lot of the oils that, uh, that are in the coffee, inside the coffee, uh, so that they're, they're then safe for when they're made uh, in, the, in the cafe. Uh, once the coffee reaches the desired temperature it's been roasted to, we then drop it out of the, the drum into, into the cooling tray. The cooling tray has a big fan that sucks air away from the, um, from the coffee beans because we effectively cook the coffee very quickly and we don't want it to overcook. So we then try and cool it down and stop the cooking process as quickly as possible. Uh, that'll sit for about four or five minutes in the cooling tray. And then from there, we'll drop it into uh, our food safe bins uh, that are plastic linings, which we then seal. We, uh, we want to make sure we preserve as much of the freshness uh, in the coffee. Uh, from there, we then uh, pack it according to order. So our customers will phone us and uh, they'll ask for a particular blend or a particular origin, uh, and we pack the coffee for them. The people we supply are uh, coffee, independent coffee houses uh, around the city, uh, some ho hotels and some popular restaurants uh, all over Durban. We then have an online store and uh, we have Durbanites who have moved to either Joburg or Cape Town who regularly order online um, and we will then pack their coffee order for them uh, and ship it uh, via courier to, to either Joburg or Cape Town. And now over to Kyle Frazier's other business. Plus Narrative specializes in digital strategy, web and app development, user experience design, social media marketing, content production, copywriting, photography, and videography. Plus Narrative is a results-driven digital marketing agency that isn't afraid to push the boundaries in order to see your business grow. Find them at the Foundry, second floor, 43rd Station Drive in Berea. Our Entrepreneur of the Week on Biz Today is Kyle Frazier. A driven entrepreneur and consultant, Kyle Frazier's impressive resume includes being a marketing director and co-owner at the iconic Colombo Tea and Coffee. He's also the founder and co-owner of one of Durban's hippest coffee places, the Factory Cafe, and now director of strategy at Plus Narrative, a strategic content marketing and development agency. Plus Narrative's philosophy, understand, strategize, create, engage. Kyle, those are my power words. They're power words for me. I absolutely love those. Welcome to Biz Today as our Entrepreneur of the Week. Thank you so much, Nazreen. It's good to be here. It's wonderful to have you in studio. I, you know, I was thinking about the kind of entrepreneurs we wanted to get into the studio. And you were, you were one of the first people that came to mind because I think we need shining examples of young entrepreneurs breaking the stereotype that you don't necessarily have to have a nine to five and you know, have that sort of cultural conditioning of the mind. So thanks, thanks so for joining us on the show. Thank Brilliant. You. So let's kick it off. Let's just start to understand the mind of an entrepreneur and just think about what started your entrepreneurial journey. So I'd say I didn't ever really intend on being an entrepreneur. I didn't wake up one day and say, okay, you know, this is what I do. Uh, I think uh, at school, I, I wasn't exactly the type of person that you'd want to lead. 
and I ended up uh, taking on sort of leadership roles yeah. in some cases, not too often if I'm honest. Uh -huh. Uh, when I was doing my degree, I thought that I'd go into uh, corporate life. I really didn't think that I'd be an entrepreneur. And what started it all off, I think, was at uh, my time at Columbo. I had the opportunity to start to run a business yeah. the way that I wanted to run it. And I took that on as an entrepreneur. And that's what I'm, uh, I also want to explore a bit more. Because if you, you're going to tell us a little bit more about what Columbo Tea and Coffee was. Yeah. And how did you hook onto that idea that it could be something so much more? So, I, and again, I, I didn't do that necessarily intentionally. Yeah. Um, when I joined the business, I knew that it wasn't the way that it could be. Uh -huh. And the way that it could be was just a, a figment of my imagination. And the way that I supposed that it would be in the future isn't the way that it is now. When I came to the company, what I tried to do was bring a different type of energy. Yeah. And I tried to formulate a business and a brand in the way that people would grow to love. I didn't necessarily try and change everything. I tried to use what we had. So when I joined Colombo, I found a very old business that was blending tea and roasting coffee. And I tried to take those things about the business that I loved the most, because yeah. we were doing other things too. And I tried to frame those things in a way that was about expertise. So I'm gonna think about this a little bit. You went into Colombo Tea and Coffee, you were approached, were you officially approached as an employee and then came in with an yeah. entrepreneurial spirit? Yeah, that's exactly it. So I came in as an employee. I was employed as a marketing manager right. of the brand. And the first thing that an employee of Colombo asked me at the time was, what are you going to market? Wow. And I think my answer was, I'm, I'm honestly not sure. So uh, just to give our viewers an understanding of Colombo Tea and Coffee's, um, how would we say, their circumstances at the time or the type of business that they were, enough for you to say you're going to throw in such a you know, controversial strategy for want of a better word. Well, what was it like at that time that really threw them out of their seats? So, so it was a gradual ramp up. Yeah. You know, it didn't just happen overnight. It wasn't something that I um, thought of one day and then implemented. I had to really get to know the business and I had to get people to trust me too. That's important, the trust yeah. bit. Yeah. And not just internally, but externally. I had to get old relationships with customers handed over to me right. um, as a young gun, as somebody that they didn't necessarily trust. And I had to, I had to earn that trust. That was a bit of a challenge you found. Oh yeah. yeah. And that, wasn't, that was one of the challenges. I think there were many. And that, that was the thing that attracted me the most. And I think the reason I know now that I'm an entrepreneur is how attracted I was to the challenge of not just turning around a business, but making it my own. It was very important to me. Yeah. I took ownership of it in my mind long before I got ownership on paper. And that's so important because I think the surreal struggle ha happens within yourself. Mm. And so you change your mindset in order to exact or manifest that which you are thinking about, which is, which is so critical, I think, for entrepreneurs yeah. or entrepreneurs to be, is that if you don't have that particular mindset, then the next step is very, very difficult. I agree. So we need mindset, but there's also a great debate about qualification. You, do you have any formal qualifications? I have a degree, yeah. um, if that classifies as a formal qualification. Of course, any, anything that's, uh, that you've graduated in yeah. should qualify. So I graduated, I got a, a BCom in marketing right. and in business management. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, I think it added quite a lot of value to me as an individual. Mm -hmm. I think it uh, mostly added value to me because of my lecturers. And I've told this story quite a few times of how my lecturers were the, the main driving force behind my degree, not necessarily the piece of paper that you get in the end. Uh -huh. I made friends with my lecturers and I, I got a lot of mentorship from them. And that was the most important part. And I think, I mean, we're going to explore mentorship a bit later in the interview, but what I want to ask you though is, and this is a, a debate that's raging, um, especially in our new world of San Francisco or Silicon Valley uh, overnight millionaires, high school dropouts or university dropouts. Yeah. But do you think that it's particularly important uh, to have a formal qualification and is this going to aid you as an entrepreneur or not? What do you think? I think it really depends on what you do with it. 
it's not about how you learn things because now we know that the internet's provided us with a learning capacity that we've never had before. So I don't think it's about what you're learning necessarily yeah. uh, or how you're learning it because I think each person kind of has their own style mm -hmm. of how they want to learn. And I've talked about this a lot too. Yes. But what I believe is that if you can learn anything that you need to learn in any way that you need to learn it, then you need to choose the right path for you. The difficulty is that you, always, you don't always get to experience that before you actually undergo it, if that makes sense. Yes, of course. So I learned during my degree that that was pretty good for me. I did, I did well and I took to it pretty well. I wasn't always at lectures and I wasn't a dropout. There was a good mix of the two for me. But this is good. If you weren't always at lectures, it means you were learning real life, right? And I think that was the most important part. So let's say this, in my degree, I learned a few things. Most of it was real life scenarios mm. that were emulated. So it wasn't always exactly, you know, simulated. Yeah. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't always exactly real life, but it wasn't always exactly theory. I was lucky enough to be in a relatively small class, not very small, not very big, where I got to engage yeah. with my lecturers. That was the best value. Was that the same amount of value that I received in the real business world? I don't think so. I think if I had the opportunity to start, I don't know how many people would have trusted me without any, any form of, uh, of learnership. It's one of the challenges we face, oh, right? Yeah. If I had the opportunity to start working and learning at the same time, I would take it. I took it then. So when I first started my degree, I was working. Mm. And I learned so much more than anyone else in the class who wasn't working. In my opinion, I learned the things that I wanted to learn. You were applying your mind in the real world, which yeah. I mean, you know, that uh, constant debate about universities versus um, techs and, yes. and having that practical application of the knowledge. But, you know, we're talking a lot about your sort of career, entrepreneurial career path. You were the co-marketing director and uh, one of now the co-owners at Colombo Tea and Coffee. Yes. But then you went on to found the Factory Cafe which is such a cool joint in Durban. And I mean, you. You, you know, if the viewers know this, and if you're ever in Durban, please visit the Factory Cafe. It's just one of those places that you can sit and work. Um, I see whenever I've come in, there's people always hooked up to their laptops. It's a very nice space for people to also explore their entrepreneurial streak. Mm. So what happened? How did this come about? Well, one of the main reasons I loved Colombo was the building that I found them in, yeah. that I was invited to. And this old building was built in the, uh, I think it was in the 40s originally, and it was built by the family that ran Colombo. And it's just this really big open space. You've been there, so you know. Mm. And I wanted to live there. I thought that I could literally have one of those sort of New York um, meat market uh, sort of loft apartments. Of course, well, just please let us know where it's based again. It's 369 Gale Street. Yeah. Um, it's now called Maguaza Mapalala, mm. uh, one road below Ambilo Road in Glenwood. Mm. And it's an industrial area. So when I said I wanted to live there, I think that would have been more logical than setting up a cafe. And so we did the cafe. Yeah. And that's part of my personality as well. A lot of people said, this isn't going to work, including myself. Mm. And that made me want to challenge it even more. That made me want to do it. The more people said, I don't think this is going to work, the more that fueled my passion and enthusiasm for it. And when we eventually launched, we were really well supported. We have been for four years now. So it's not a new business by, by you know, that sort of um, category yes. for a cafe. It's been around for a while and it's done well. We started as a barista training center. So it's very much linked to Colombo. You know, a lot of people don't know that actually, that you started as a barista training center. Yes. But yeah. now it's a wonderful cafe that a lot of families and yeah. friends and working or studying groups come in. And it's open to the public. And when we opened it to the public, when we said we'll let anybody through the doors, we'd make anybody a cup of coffee. I think that was a moment of realization for me yeah. that it could actually be a cafe. What I like about your story also is that it's a natural progression of having invested yourself in a particular industry. Yes. And I think it's important also for viewers who are listening to the story and trying to understand where is it that we can take our dreams or whatever industry that we've planned to transplanted ourselves into. 
there's possibly something that sparks us to be able to move forward. Mm. Now, in looking at that, I, you know, I know in the conversations I've had with you prior, I know that digital has played a massive role in helping you to catapult your businesses to the next level. Yes. So, Plus Narrative is your new baby. I don't know how old the baby is, but <laughs> you're the strategic director at Plus Narrative. So is this, um, I mean, it's, it seems a natural progression, but well, is it a direct offshoot from your learnings with having set up Colombo Tea and Coffee and Factory Cafe? I wouldn't define it as a, a complete offshoot, mm. but I do think that it was a part of that natural progression yes. that you're talking about. A plus narrative for me was my opportunity to take things that I had learned, some of it being at Colombo, mm -hmm. some of it being through consultancy yes. from people who came to me and said, wow, this brand is incredible. You need to do this for me. And so I did some of that consultancy along the way. And I was fortunate enough to be in a position that I could offer my skills. And what I found is I needed uh, an outlet for it. And it started small and it grew really quickly and it became a, a passion project. And I think that was the most important part about it. The fact that I really cared about it yeah. and the fact that Plus Narrative became the opportunity to uh, show other people how content could be done and driven and how I could work with other brands. Um, I think that, that really, that energized me. So I'm just gonna explore um, Plus Narrative a little bit, sure. but it's about content and social media strategy and creation. And I think content is uh, your magic word there because it, it's like television or any kind of broadcast medium yeah. where content is the core of everything and the production of that and the, the, you know, the aggregation or selection of it is a, is a massive task. So I think it's interesting how you've moved from people, if, if they're going to say this in the very basic mm. form, is that you move from coffee mm. to content. Mm. Is that, uh, how is that for you? Yeah, so you could say that coffee connects people yeah. and uh, content in this case yeah. now connects people too. Connects brands to mm. people, connects people to brands and people to other people. So yeah, I do see it as the same relationship building, the same community building. Mm -hmm. uh, we built a community in coffee, yeah. not just at the factory cafe, but other cafes that I've consulted for and helped and uh, been part of. And we built a community around Colombo, around the brand. Mm -hmm. And I have done the same thing for other brands too. And so it's, uh, I think it is that connector remembering also that at Colombo I did have the opportunity to do a lot of content marketing. Yeah. I had the opportunity to take our relatively low budget and spend it on the things that I believed really engaged with people. So we created, we created content marketing campaigns before I knew that was a thing. And we created email campaigns before I knew I'd be, I'd be doing that for other people. We created communities on social media before they were monetized. And that was my gradual progression. The ramp up was my opportunity to actually offer that as a service. So we've explored a, a bit about your early life and the fact that do we need a qualification or not? And also you seem to be a bit of serial entrepreneur, yes. which is, you know, I, I don't, I, I like the story and I like that we're telling it to our viewers because to be a serial, serial entrepreneur is something else. You've got to have that incredible passion to say I can give uh, life to many visions mm. and there are many of us who are entrepreneurs and we are building one business and we're trying to create a legacy or offshoots out of that. So it brings me to my next question which is vitally important for us to understand as entrepreneurs what are the top qualities that we should be looking out for or that people will identify as someone who could be successful as an entrepreneur? You know and I think I read a lot of content about this every day yeah. and I'm engaging with stuff all the time that says this is how you need to be an entrepreneur. Do you, do you often, uh, you know you've got to take it with a pinch of salt sometimes. You do, you do and a lot of the time it's, it's rubbish um, you, because there's not this one size fits all That's right. um, approach you know, and I've started a podcast recently about that. All right, where can uh, people find that? Uh, it's not released just yet, oh. but I'll let you know when the time comes. Okay. Maybe we can talk again. That, that will be great. Yeah, and um, I, I believe that uh, the things that I have that make me the entrepreneur that I am yeah. aren't necessarily the things that everybody needs. Um, but we can talk about those. Mm. So one of the qualities that I think I bring to a business, to entrepreneurship, 
is uh, tenacity. So you said energy and you know the bringing life to new things and continuously. Um, a lot of people have said to me, uh, "When do you stop?" And I, I don't really. I think that's part of my personality. I'm really uh, excitable, yeah. and I get very easily distracted. And uh, I think that's a good quality when it comes to an entrepreneur, not just a serial entrepreneur, but an entrepreneur in business. Is you've got to have the energy to want to keep going. And another one of those qualities I think that I could define in myself is flexibility. Yeah. I'm not afraid to change something. I embrace change. When I saw the opportunity to change something at an old business, I took it. Even though it was a really big challenge and everybody said, don't try this. Yeah. And every book you read will say, you know, don't reposition, don't rebrand, you know, don't take on those projects. It was something that I really wanted to do. And I think that's that sort of flexibility, that love of change. That's another thing that I think fuels me. And something really important to me as an entrepreneur, which I know other friends of mine who aren't uh, entrepreneurs and who are, don't necessarily um, agree, but I think it's very important to have vision. And that doesn't necessarily mean a five-year plan. Of course. But I like that you said that because a lot of entrepreneurs are struggling to grasp all the requirements for you to be able to begin a business mm -hmm. and don't necessarily know how to go about accessing finance, registering a company, um, networking with the correct people. Mm -hmm. So I like that you said that. It mm -hmm. gives people who want to explore that option mm -hmm. hope that mm. we don't have to follow the no. what is called the tried and tested method, although that does work. There are many ways to do uh, the same thing and be successful. And you remind me so much of um, when, uh, reading Donald Trump's book, Think Big and Kick yeah. Ass, and he says, I mean, he's one uh, hell of a character, <laughs> but some of his lessons are pretty good, and I remember them sometimes. And he says um, people advised him strictly against buying what is now Wall Street. Yeah. And the, I think he owns most of the re uh, yeah. real estate in, in New York City. Yeah. And he took it anyway, and it's, it's far exceeded its market value. Mm. But you remind me so much of that, because I think that's a very striking quality in an entrepreneur, is to be able to see value in something that other people can't readily see that. Mm. So that's incredible. Yeah, Malcolm, well, is that Malcolm Gladwell calls that disagreeableness. Disagreeableness. So I'm not just going to do things because everyone yeah. else agrees that that's the right way to do it. And um, uh, you can see that as argumentative in some cases, mm -hmm. but a lot of the time it's because I stand up for what I believe in. Yep. And if entrepreneurs do that, then already if you can back that up with some sort of substantiation, you've, you're winning over people, you're, you're being an activist for something, you're not just doing that's it right. for the sake of it. And that's another very important thing for me. And I, I want to explore that now, and I want you to say, obviously, well not to say, to advise young people out there, you know, young entrepreneurs to be, because that authenticity within yourself and the conviction to be able to build something of value mm. is what will ensure that it lasts. You know, yes. you build a legacy that lasts and inspires others. Oh, yeah, we and, hope so. And we hope so, yeah. right? And that's what, we, what, that's what we're able to gauge from um, listening to you speaking. That's exactly what I'm getting. So what would you say to young South Africans? Are there best advice you could give to an entrepreneur? Um, to be able to start up, especially in this economy? Yeah, I think right now you need to identify uh, something that people need before they know that they need it. And that's, that's a difficult thing to do. Um, or you could potentially look at it differently and say, if you've got a really good idea mm -hmm. and everybody thinks that it's a good idea, yeah. you might want to investigate as to why. And the reason I say that is often when you start something, just because people are all agreeing with you, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be successful at that thing. And a lot of people get very excited. And the reality is we can be stubbornly optimistic as entrepreneurs. I am. When I believe in something, I'm stubbornly optimistic. I won't let anybody stand right. in my way. And sometimes you're barking up the wrong tree. And I'm not talking about market research. I'm talking about actually asking yourself, how, how are people going to experience this? Feeling empathy yeah. for people and realizing that you can actually create something that can also do and have a greater impact. And I think that's the, that's the place to start. In this country right now, if you can create impact, 
You talk about social entrepreneurship, I think it's more than that. It's creating sustainable impact, doing something with the business that you want to create that people can really get behind. Mm. So if you've got a good idea that everybody thinks is a great idea, you've got to ask yourself, what does it do for mankind? What does it do for people? Is it going to really impact lives? Because if it is, get behind it. And we're trying to get in our particular, in my field now as an agency, we're trying to get our customers to think like that. We're trying to get the brands that we work with to think like that. And it can be challenging. But if young entrepreneurs can do that now, create an impact, I believe people will get behind them. And that's one of the most, I think, significant things I've heard recently, especially that bit of advice, is that to create an impact. And I keep bringing it back to the fact that we live in such a, an amazing, diverse country of cultures and you know, languages and people mm. and types. Mm. And so the ability for you to navigate that is so much more defined because then it's, it's almost, it's so real that if you're able to identify a certain problem, like you say, the, the innovation and all those wonderful buzz keywords that we have in our industries and create real change from that. You remind me so much of um, Maria Ramos, yes. the chief of, I think it is ABSA, ABSA. for Africa. And she wrote a very nice piece talking about innovation in Africa, talking about how a 13-year-old in Kenya used the tools around him, very basic tools, didn't have to buy them, to be able to light up the kraal around his home so that he could keep the mm. family cattle safe yes. at night. And you've hit an incredible, incredibly interesting point there, mm. which I think links very nicely to another topic that we talked about a little bit earlier, which is mentorship. Yes. So we can create an impact in the country, but then we need people who can guide that impact. So how important are mentors to you and has it been a significant part of your career? It's been a very big part of my career. Up until this point, I believe that you're a, you're a formula of all of these different uh, interactions that you've had in your life. Yeah. And you know, I, I can't attribute them all to myself. A lot of the people that I've encountered, I've asked, you know, will you be a mentor to me? Really naively. And sometimes it's worked brilliantly and sometimes other people are, are less responsive. Just for clarity, yes. when you approach a mentor, do you have to pay them or not? Not always. Yeah. Um, in my life, if I've had to pay them, uh, there's no chance they're actually a mentor. That's a consultant. Of course. A mentor is somebody who invests in you because they care about you and because they believe in you. And uh, even if they don't believe in what you're doing, they believe in what you could be. And so I've always tried to, and it is, you have to convince people, you have to win over their trust. But I, I've worked pretty hard to have the right mentors around me because I really believe you need that positive influence in life. Kyle, to um, sadly come to a close in our very, very interesting conversation. I'm sure we're going to get you back on the show and talk about a number of different issues that are affecting young entrepreneurs in South Africa. But, uh, you know, this is just a question that came to me and I, I wanted to explore it with you because it's very pertinent, especially in the environment we live in. But at the Stanford um, Women in Business Conference, the Snapchat CEO, Evan Spiegel, I'm sure I said his surname correctly. If he hears this interview, he might not be very happy. <laughs> Evan Spiegel um, said that he, I mean, he's one of the, the, the young you know, San Francisco, Silicon yeah. Valley, s mega successes, early yeah, yeah. 20s, has more wealth than he can dream what to do with it. And he said that he's a white, educated young male, and this is the reason for his success. Mm. And he just got lucky. Mm. How fair is that statement, especially in, in an environment like ours? And what would you say to that? You know, I, I, I don't often see myself through that filter. Yeah. And I think, um, I think maybe it's more obvious to other people. But for me, it's not something that I think about very often. And, and that's honest. At the same time, I, you, you must know that your culture, and I think more importantly than anything else, then your, your tone of skin will influence the people that you, uh, that you connect with yeah. and that take you somewhere in life. Uh, I've been given a lot of things. And hearing that makes me question, maybe that is just privilege. Maybe it is just my um, own abilities, but I don't, think you, I, I don't think I will ever truly know, sort of past tense. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, in life as an entrepreneur, 
um, if you don't have the fighting spirit to do it whatever race you are, to, to do the things that you believe in, then you shouldn't be an entrepreneur. Mm. So for me, personally, I don't see it through that filter that he, he sees it through. I don't necessarily believe that it's only privilege. Have I been privileged? Most definitely. I definitely have. I can't question that. But I think we live in a time now where if we focus on that and that alone, um, I think we're missing the point. Yeah. And, you know, he at this point can say and look back and be retrospective and say, I, I think it's his privilege. Me right now, at this point, um, I, I like to think that I've done what I've done up until this you know, time of my life, mostly out of the connections around me and my own tenacity. And I hope that in the future, the same thing will apply. I hope to get rid of that boundary. And maybe that's part of the impact, is work with people yeah. who I'm not supposed to work with. Everyone tells me that's not a good idea. Maybe, maybe that's something that we can challenge. Kyle, your example is an, a shining and inspiring one for young South Africans. You've built up um, three amazing businesses that are on the road to everywhere. And of course, it's digital that's powered it. And, uh, and we're going to explore this hopefully in, in many more shows to come because digital is the underlying driving force behind many, many industries. It was such a pleasure to have you in the studio and please come and join us again. Thank you so much, Nazreen. I've really enjoyed it. It Thank was you. wonderful to have you in the studio. That was Kyle Frazier, co-owner, we'd say, and marketing director at Colombo Tea and Coffee the co-owner or rather founder at Factory Cafe and strategic director at Plus Narrative.